So stewardship. So I'd like for you guys to think with me. My dream car is to get this nice truck, okay, like Toyota, Tacoma, slight lift, like completely black, or there's this beautiful blue color, and I would just love to have a truck, and I'd love to go to the mountains to go camping in it. I'd like to help people move. Like, that's my dream car is to get a nice Toyota Tacoma. Well, imagine with me that someone comes up to me and says, Johnny, I have your dream truck, and the title is in your name. Here are the keys to it. I own it. Well, so the, the person giving it to me, they own the truck, but they're like, Johnny, I'm giving you this truck. My only thing is I just want you to use it to help people move. Like you can use it for driving to work, all that good stuff, but use this truck to help people move. Anytime someone comes to Compass and says, hey, we're moving from California, you use the truck to help them move. That's the only thing. I'm like, all right, sounds good. Well, let's say then I'm so excited. I get this truck and I hop in, I start driving it. But, you know, I'm, I'm kind of lazy and I never change the oil. And so the engine starts to have trouble. I put the gas in the car maybe like once a month. So it's always like almost on empty. I've been stranded a few times. I never change the brake pads. And so sometimes I'm like swerving all around, just trying not to hit people. It's not stopping. The paint's starting to rust. It's starting to flake. And people are like, hey, Johnny, we just moved from California. And I'm like, uh, sorry, I'm busy. I can't help you. I'm not going to be able to use my truck to help you this weekend. I was going to go to the mountains and do some camping. So sorry, you'll have to ask Amir with his black truck, but whatever. Um, and then let's say the owner of this truck, he comes back. He's like, hey, Johnny, how's my truck? You've been helping people move, all that good stuff. And I'm like, oh, no. And he looks at the truck and like one of the wheels is flat and like paint's flaking off. One of the windows is smashed. He gets in to start it and it's making that noise where it's like, like it's not starting at all. He's like, what'd you do to my truck? And he's like, did you just use it so much helping so many people move that the truck just doesn't work anymore? And I was like, uh, nope. I used it to go camping and racing and I just didn't really take care of it. What's that guy going to do? He's going to be pretty mad at me, right? Because I didn't use the truck for its intended purpose. And even more than that, I didn't even take care of the truck. It was my dream truck, but I didn't even take care of it or appreciate it or anything. Or maybe this, this one might hit closer to home for you guys. So how many of you have younger siblings? Have you guys gotten to the point where your parents let you babysit your younger siblings? They're like, we're going to go on a date or we're going to go grocery shopping. I want you to watch your ki the kids for just a couple hours. And you're like, yes. I have power over my siblings. I get to boss them around, right? And maybe, do your parents ever leave a phone with you? So in case of emergency, you can call them and say, hey, there's a problem. Do your parents leave a phone with you? Some, sometimes, okay, okay. So this will hit home for some of you. So let's say your parents are like, all right, we're gonna go on a date. We're gonna go to a sushi place downtown. You guys, take, you take care of your siblings. Make sure to give them mac and cheese for dinner. If anything happens, call me, but don't use the phone unless you're calling me, and pick up the phone if I call you, because if I'm calling you, there's an emergency, and I need to communicate. Well, let's say you're like, sweet, sounds good. So your parents leave, you get on the phone, you start playing Angry Birds, and then you're like, dude, I'm kind of bored. I'm going to call my friend, and we're just going to chat it up for a while. It's going to be great. And your parents try calling you because your dad is allergic to fish, and he starts like, going into shock and you're like rushing to the, your mom's rushing to the hospital like, we got to take care of dad. And you're just chatting to your friend, having a good time, playing Angry Birds, all this. Your mom's trying to get a hold of you. And then eventually you hear a knock on the door, like aggressive pounding. You're like, oh no, I got to go. And you go answer the door and it's your mom. And your dad's got like a swollen face shut and he's like allergic to fish. He's like, hey, and they're like, why, could, why didn't you answer the phone? We tried calling you. What's going on? And then you see your brother's like hanging on to the loft, like barely, like he's, he's going to fall from the ceiling. And you're like, what is happening? It's like absolute chaos. The smoke alarm's going off because the mac and cheese is burning. It's just a mess, right? Hopefully that's never happened to any of you guys. I doubt it. But what's the problem? You didn't use the phone the way your mom told you to use the phone. You used it for something else and lots of problems happened. So you were what we would call a poor steward of that phone, or I was a poor steward of the truck. 
And so we're going to be talking about stewardship over the next three weeks because God has given us certain things, more like, unlike a phone or unlike a truck, he's given us other things and he's entrusted them saying, hey, I'm giving this to you, use it for a certain purpose and use it for this reason. And you have the choice, you can either use what God has given you for the right purpose in the right way, or you can be like the kid who's sitting on his phone talking to his friend and playing Angry Birds instead of how it was supposed to be. You can use the things that God has given you, but you can use them for yourself. You can use them for wrong reasons. You can waste them. You cannot take care of them, and that would be poor stewardship. So over the next few weeks, we're going to be looking at what is stewardship in general. We're going to look at how do you steward your time? How do you steward your resources? How do you steward your relationship with the Lord? And we're going to look at how are you faithful in these things. And so write this down, and we're going to try to get this ingrained into our minds over the next three weeks. This is going to be the working definition, and we'll define this as we go through it. But stewardship, this is how we're going to define it, is faithful management of divine property. Stewardship is going to be faithful management of divine property. And that's not on the slide, so I'm sorry. But I'll get that up there for next time. But yeah, stewardship is faithful management of divine property. So God has created everything, right? We look back in Genesis, and he created the world. He created everything in the world. He created mankind. And what did he tell them? He said, I am placing you over all of creation. Go have dominion over the earth. Be fruitful, multiply, and rule over the earth. God created this beautiful earth, and he said, here you go. I want sh- I'm entrusting it to you. I want you to take care of it. He wanted us to be stewards, right? He wanted us to take care of the plants, of the animals, to enjoy what he created for us. So we should know what's been entrusted to us, and we should know how to take care of those things, right? If someone gives me a truck, I should know, oh, This guy's trusting me with his truck. I shouldn't just let anyone drive it. He's trusting me with the truck. I should also know how to take care of it, right? If your mom trusts you with the phone, you should know, okay, mom's trusting me with her phone. That means that not anyone gets to hold on to this. I'm responsible for it, and I should know how to take care of it. I should take good care and use it rightly, right? And you may not feel like you have a ton of responsibilities right now. Maybe you're in a stage where you're like, I feel like, Life is easy. My parents don't really ask me to do much, or I I wish I could be doing more. I'd be excited to get to high school so I can have a driver's license, so I can have my own car, so I can do these things. I want to have a job. I want all of these different things, all these responsibilities. And that time will come for all of you guys. But what you need to do is you need to develop a biblical stewardship now. How you view your role as a steward now, how you take care of things now, is going to set the trajectory and set the pattern for how you take care of things later. How you, whatever's been entrusted to you, whether it's babysitting your siblings, your homework, your chores, whatever it may be, you've been entrusted certain things from God. You've been entrusted certain things from your parents, maybe from your teachers. But God has given you those things. And how you steward that now, you're setting habits, you're setting patterns, you're developing a way of thinking to where someday when you have all these other responsibilities, someday when you're moved out of the house, you have your own job, you have your own family, what's crazy is your view of stewardship, it may not have changed a whole lot from when you were in middle school. I know for me, there are things that I developed when I was younger, middle school, elementary, even high school, there are certain habits that I still have as far as stewardship today. Some of them good, some of them bad. And the bad habits with stewardship are a lot harder to break now than if I would have dealt with them when I was in middle school. And so the goal of this is we want to help set you guys on a good trajectory. The the consequences for poor stewardship now for you guys, it's, it's not as huge of a consequence, right? So think of it this way. If you have ping pong balls and I give you like 10 ping pong balls and I say, hey, learn to juggle these. You're like, all right, cool. And you're juggling them. You drop one on your foot. and You're like, oh, nothing didn't hurt. You drop them. The balls are fine right? Well, eventually, I'm like, all right, now I want you to juggle some tennis balls. And now it's like, okay, you're juggling them. They're a little bit more bouncy, so it's like you have to go further to catch them, whatever. Um, But then I give you basketballs. Okay, so now juggling basketballs, you jam your finger. That hurts. That hurts a lot. And then eventually, I'm like, all right, final challenge. I want you to juggle 
bowling balls. Dropping a bowling ball on your foot is going to hurt a lot more than dropping a ping pong ball. So that's how life is, right? We, we learn and we grow in our capacity. And so right now, the things that are entrusted to you that you're responsible to take care of, if you drop something or if you fail, the consequences aren't going to hurt as much. But when you're an adult, if you're given something and you're entrusted with something and you drop that or you fail, the consequences can be so much bigger and painful and hurtful. And so think of it this way. Luke 16.10 says, One who is faithful in very little is also faithful in much. And one who is dishonest in a very little is also dishonest in much. And so as we get into this, I want you to understand the importance. I, my prayer for you is that you can learn good habits of stewardship. You can learn the importance of stewardship now so that in 10 15, 20 years, when you're entrusted with much bigger things, you've set these good habits. You know what good stewardship is. You know what your responsibilities are, and you can do that well. Will you still fail sometimes? Absolutely. But knowing how to be a good steward and having those habits and that character in place, it's going to be invaluable. So with that, let's look at our passage for this evening. 1 Peter 4, we're just going to look at two verses 1 Peter 10, 4, 10, and 11. Starting in verse 10, it says this. <clears throat> as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God. Whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies. In order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. All right, so looking at that first verse, it says, as each has received a gift, what gift is it talking about? Well, what I believe that the gift is talking about here is this. So if you're a Christian, if you're in Christ, right, God has paid for your sin. He has given you new life. He's given you the Holy Spirit inside of you, and this is your gift. God has given you specific skill sets. God has given you specific circumstances He's given you the gospel. He's given you strength. And what he calls you to is to use those things to serve him and bring him glory in that context. So let's break that down, right? God has given me the ability to play guitar and to sing. He's given me the opportunity to study the Bible for college. And he has put me in this circumstance right here with you guys at Compass Bible Church. He's given me the Holy Spirit inside of me. So my gift, what God has given me, he's given me the opportunity to use the talents that he's given me, to, given me, to use the skills that he's given me to serve you guys, to serve our church on Sundays with worship, and the Spirit works in me and helps to advance those things. That is my gift, right? For other people like Pastor Ben, his gift is preaching on a weekly basis on Sundays, is counseling, it's leading our church as our lead pastor, you look at someone like Brendan Sherlock. He's just super good with sound stuff. Like that stuff goes over my head, but he's great at that. And he has the opportunity to serve. So your gift, what he's talking about here, as each has received a gift, it's your skill set and your specific circumstances and your opportunity to use those to serve the Lord. And that will change at different times depending on your circumstances, where God has you. Your gifts may change over time. <coughs> so, we see, as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another. So who is receiving the gift? The people receiving the gift are believers. They are people who are in Christ. They are people who have confessed their sins. They are in Christ. If you're not a believer, then you've not received this gift. You have not received the Holy Spirit, and you don't have the same gift and opportunity to serve the body, to serve the Lord, and to use the giftings that the Holy Spirit has given you. And so I would encourage you, if you have not Put your faith and trust in Christ. Do that now and become a partaker in this. But <clears throat> the gift, the, the recipient of the gift is God's people. And who's giving it? God is giving the gift. So we need to adopt the mindset that we've been given certain skills. We've been put in certain circumstances for God's glory. Okay, Wherever you're at, if you're a believer, God has given you very specific skills. God has given you your 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 personality. He's created you just the way he wants you. And with the spirit inside of you, he helps you to be good at certain things. And he's put you in a certain circumstance. You're interacting with certain people that I will never interact with. 
And God has put you there to glorify him. You have a very unique thing. That's, that's a gift. But you have to see that God gave that to you, right? So you look at someone like Tim Tebow, who's a professing believer, right? God has given him his athletic abilities and his public speaking abilities and placed him in a very specific circle to use his gifting to share the gospel and glorify God in that context. God has given Paul very specific gifts so that he can serve the Lord, glorify God, and make his name great at Boise State University right now, right? And for each of you, we could go down the line. If you're believing in Christ and God has given you certain gifts, he's put you in a certain place so that you can use those gifts to glorify God. That is very specific. And you have to adopt the mindset that God has given that to you. That's not something that you own or you did on your own. God gave that to you. Just like someone gave me the truck or your mom gave you the phone. It's not your phone. It's not my truck. Someone else gave it to you. God has given us these gifts. God has given us these circumstances. So if we want to be good stewards of these things, we need to know what are those skills. If we want to know how to use those, we need to understand what does the Bible say about this? How do we use them in our current circumstance? And how do we do it for God's glory? All right, so we're, we're talking a lot about the word steward, so we should probably define that, right? How many of you guys know what a steward is? <coughs> okay, yeah, so this is good. So a steward is a person who is employed to manage another person's property, especially like a large house or an estate, a person whose responsibility is to take care of something, right? So you think of maybe someone owns a mansion, it's like, I'm hiring you, because maybe this person owns like three different mansions, and he lives in the mansion in Alaska, but he has another mansion in France. And so he hires someone as a steward and says, I want you to take care of my house in France. Does the guy in France own that mansion? No, but he lives at that mansion. He takes care of it. He makes sure the grass is clean, and he makes sure that the house stays clean. He makes sure it looks nice, makes sure no one's moving in and living in the attic like my friend, right? That is what a steward does. He looks after someone else's property. And so for us, we are all stewards because God has entrusted things to us. It's God's property. God owns the earth. God owns everything in the earth. He created it. It's his. God owns everything. But you know what? He's entrusted each of us with this earth. He's entrusted us with our lives. He's entrusted us with gifts. He's entrusted us with his word. And he wants us to manage it, to look after it, to be responsible for it. In the same way that someone gave me the truck, that person wanted me to be responsible for the truck. Did I own it? No. But he wanted me to put gas in the truck. He wanted me to put oil in the truck, change the brakes. Your mom gave you the phone. She wanted you to use the phone in the right way. And God has given us things, and we are responsible for them. We don't own them. When we die, we'll stand before him. They're not ours, but we're going to give an account because we were responsible for that for a time. (coughs) And we see that. Look with me in verse 11. It says this, Whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God. Whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies. And what is Peter saying here when he says that? Well, he says, hey, if your gift is teaching or preaching or speaking or whatever, if you're speaking, don't just say, don't just speak as if it's your own wisdom or your own words or your own great message. No, speak as if it is the message of God. Um, the word oracle, that, that's something that was regarded as an infallible authority or a guide on something. Okay, so when you're going to speak about something with authority, speak on God's authority. This is God's message. And then when he says, okay, if you're going to serve, serve by the strength that God supplies. Okay, so some of you guys, you show up and you're helping set up and tear down. He's saying, hey, don't just show up and serve in your own strength. Be like, yeah, I just do this because I'm great and I just want to help out. It's like, no, God has given me this strength. He's given me a healthy body. He's given me this opportunity. And so I'm going to use it to serve the church. Because what, what's the difference, right? If you're, if you're just showing up and you're like, yeah, I, I'm just here to serve. I'm a happy guy. Like, I just I want to be good to people. Like, normally the glory is going to go toward yourself, right? But if you say, you know what? God's given me this healthy body, and he's given me this opportunity. I want to use it to serve the church because that's what God wants me to do with this strength. When you view it as God's strength, who's getting the glory? God is. 
So in the same way in our church today, um, whether you're teaching, whether you're serving, or whether it's something else, you have to realize that God has given you, he's entrusted you with some certain things, everything. Nothing that we have is our own. God owns everything. So God has entrusted that, and we are called to be good stewards of this. Put it down this way for point number one. Realize that God has given you everything that you have. Realize that God has given you everything that you have. And as, as I was thinking through this, I was thinking, well, what are some of the things that we tend to think are our own, maybe that we own instead of God? Well, it's easy to think of the stuff at my house as my stuff, right? It's, it's my food. It's my couch. It's my bed. It's my uh, air conditioning, whatever it is. It's easy to think of that. Or like maybe my money, right? I work all day. Tuesday through Friday, and then Sundays, some Saturdays, I put in the hard work, it's my money, that's how, that it can be easy to think that, it's, it's my job, I went to school, I studied this, I applied, I got the job, it's my job, or you could think, well, there are skills that I've learned, I spent all this time learning guitar and piano, and so those are my skills, I put in the work, that's what I got out of my work. Or maybe it's my time, my schedule. Someone's like, hey, do you have time this week? He's like, no, my schedule, my time is full. I don't have time for you. And it can be easy to think in these ways. So think about it. Think through what are some things maybe that you think, well, these are mine. And we'll get into, well, are they really yours or are you just stewarding it for a time? Is it really your phone or your truck or are you just responsible for it for a time? So we're going to go through some different cross-references. You don't have to turn to these, but I just want to emphasize how much God has given to us, how really we're stewards of so much, but we own nothing, really. Uh, write down this cross-reference, Colossians 1, 16 and 17. Colossians 1, 16 and 17. And what you'll see there is that God gives physical life. It says this, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. So what we see is God gives physical life. If it wasn't for God, you would not be alive right now. God is sustaining you. Think about it. How many of you guys actually control your heartbeat, right? Or how many of you guys are controlling all the little neurons in your brain and making sure everything functions as it could. The heartbeat is one thing, but then you've got all your organs who are balancing your hormones and your food and digesting and all this. Like, none of you guys have control over that. None of us do. So the fact that we're, we're here, we're breathing, we're alive, that alone God has given us. So God has entrusted you with this life for right now. God has given you life. He wants you to steward that life. Well, write down this reference, John 19, 11. John 19, 11, we see that God gives authority to certain people. God gives authority. Listen to this. Jesus answered him, You would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. So this is Jesus talking to Pilate, and he's saying, Hey, guess what? You wouldn't have authority unless it was given to you. And we see that God gives authority. God establishes kings. He establishes rulers. He removes kings. He removes rulers. And so whatever authority you may have now or someday or the authority over you, you have to understand God put that there. He entrusted those people to be responsible for that authority. We're not going to read this one, but you can write down Daniel 4, 31 through 32. Daniel 4, 31 through 32. Uh, you can see that that was another example of God giving authority to Nebuchadnezzar, and he took it away. Nebuchadnezzar mocked God, so God made Nebuchadnezzar act like a cow and eat grass for a time because he was not stewarding that the way that God wanted him to, and he thought, I own this, I made myself great, this is my kingdom, and it's like, no, God gave that to you, and he can take it away. Uh, we also see that God gives us basic necessities. He gives us food, water, shelter. God gives us all of the necessities for life. Uh, Matthew 6, 31 through 33. Write that one down. Matthew 6, 31 through 33. Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. 
but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. We see that God gives us the most basic things of food and water. Yes, you may go to the store, and you may buy stuff off the shelf. Or yes, your mom may cook something for you, but who's ultimately providing that? God is. And we have to understand that God is entrusting us with these things. God has given us all of these things to be stewards of. God gives spiritual gifts. God gives spiritual gifts. That's in our passage right here, 1 Peter 4.10. We see that God gives blessings. Every good and perfect gift is from above, James 1.17. We see that God gives those things. But we also see that God gives trials and hardships. He gives those to us, and we'll see a number of reasons why. I'm going to write down some of these. Well, I'm going to read a couple of references, but write down all of these. Malachi 3.3. Malachi 3.3. Listen to this. He says, He, that's talking about God, will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver, and he will bring offerings and righteousness to the Lord. What is he saying there? Well, he's using the allegory. So when you have gold, right, sometimes like the the substance gold, there's impurities in it. And so what people will do is they'll heat it up super hot and the gold will melt and they'll take the impurities off the top and all that's left is the pure, nice, good gold. And so what Malachi is saying here is that God, he takes the sons of Levi, the Levites, and he puts them through this purifying time, removing the bad character and purifying them so that all that's left is offerings in righteousness to the Lord. And so looking at a New Testament application of this, 1 Peter 1, 6 and 7, write this down. This ties in directly. 1 Peter 1, 6 and 7, it says this. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith more precious than gold that perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. What do we see here? God gives you trials. He gives you hardships to purify you, to get rid of the sinful, bad character so that's what, that what's left is gold. What, that's good. And so you need to be a good steward of your trials. And we'll talk more about that in the coming sermons as well. Write down these references if you want to look more about how God s- gives us trials to steward. Uh, there's Job 1, 6 through 12. Job 1, 6 through 12. We see the interaction between God and Satan where God allows Satan to go and test Job to help embolden his faith. Uh, James 1, 2 through 4. James 1, 2 through 4. James exhorts people to count it all joy when they face trials, because it's going to help them grow in their faith, in their character, and steadfastness. We also see that God gives discipline. God gives discipline. Write that one down. Uh, Proverbs 3, 11 and 12. Proverbs 3, 11 and 12. It says, My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline or be weary of his pr- reproof, for the Lord reproves him who he loves as a father, the son in whom he delights. Right? And so you need to be a good steward. If, if, if God is disciplining you, respond rightly to that. Right? If your parents, if, if you get in trouble and you get grounded or something like that, you could be a good steward of that and say, okay, I'm going to learn from my mistakes. I realized what I did was wrong and here's why it was wrong. I'm going to be a good steward of that and respond rightly and change my actions. Or you can be a bad steward of that and be like, yeah, whatever, that was awful. And then you're just going to try and go back to it and just figure out how to not get caught the next time. We see that God gives wisdom, James 1, 5. God gives eternal life, Romans 6, 23. God gives joy, Psalm 4, 7. We could keep going down the list for the rest of this evening, and we could see time and time again, God gives, God gives, God gives, God gives, God gives, because God is the one who gives things to us. He entrusts us, and he wants us to deal with that responsibly, right? If someone said, hey, I want you to be the steward of this mansion in France. You're going to want to take care of it, right? Because if this rich guy comes and his house is destroyed, he's not going to be happy with you, and there's going to probably be some bad consequences, right? God has entrusted you with so many different things, and you need to be a good steward of them because the Lord of the universe, he wants you to be a good steward. (coughs) So for, for way of application, right, look at your own life. 
what things have been given to you. Think about it. What has God given you? We, we know some of the basics, like God has given you life, breath. He's given you food, water, rest, shelter. We know those things, but think about it. If you're a believer in Christ, what gifts has he given you? What circumstances has he put you in? Are you going through maybe a trial or a, a hard time right now? Maybe it's a good time. Maybe think about the specific family that you're in or the specific friends that you have or the fact that you're here at the Grove tonight and not somewhere else. Think about where, where does God have you? What has he given you to be a steward of? And think, okay, how are you currently stewarding those things? Because we're either good stewards or we're bad stewards. It's, that's the two categories. There's no in-between, right? Maybe you think, okay, with me, like God has given me the ability to play music and lead worship. Now, I could be a bad steward and be like, yeah, I'm not going to do that. I don't really like singing. I'd rather go be like a website designer for churches. And it's like, that's not my gifting. I'm not being a good steward of that. And <clears throat> Or on the flip side, I could say, you know what? I love guitar and piano, and I just want to go on tour and do concerts, and I want everyone to know my name and think I'm the best. That's not going to happen because I'm not that good. But anyways, um, yeah, it's that, that would be a poor stewardship because that's not why God gave it to me. He gave it to me to bring him glory. And so I, I would encourage you to think about, okay, what has God entrusted to you, and how are you currently stewarding it? Based off of how you're living, think about this. Who do you think owns the property? Do you think this is my gift, this is my skill, this is my thing, or are you thinking this is God's? And then based off of that, think about how are you treating that property, right? Are you, are you using it the right way, or are you just wasting it, or are you using it for yourself, or are you trying to use it for God? And then think about this. The gifts that God has given you, who, who is it benefiting? The way that you're using it, who is it benefiting? Is it benefiting you in your glory? Is it benefiting God in his glory? Because, or is it just sitting there being wasted, right? Because if I'm using my guitar abilities, but it's all just to say, wow, Johnny's so cool, he's so good at the guitar, that, I, I'm wasting it. That's a terrible use of the gift. But I could be using it to worship the Lord and say, look at how great our God is, and I can just use the guitar to be like, hey, let's make a joyful noise because we love who God is. So think about the gifts that you have, the circumstances that you have, whatever God has entrusted to you. The way that you're using it now, who is it benefiting? Is it benefiting you or is it benefiting God's glory? So by now, hopefully, you're thinking through, okay, I know there are certain things that God has entrusted to me, and I know that I'm currently stewarding it somehow. You're managing that property somehow. But now let's ask the question, how should you be stewarding it, right? How should you be taking care of those things? Let's go back to the text, 1 Peter 10, 4, 10, and 11. Uh, Peter writes, uh, use these things as good stewards of God's varied grace. And at the end of verse 11, he says, In order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. <clears throat> so what do we see here? So just like uh, the truck for helping others, just like the phone for babysitting, we see that God has given us things. He's entrusted us with things but it's for a very specific purpose. The purpose that he's given you these things is to bring him glory, right? If the person entrusted me with the truck, it was so that I could help people move. Your mom trusts you with the phone so that you can call her in the case of emer an emergency. God has entrusted you with your life. He's entrusted you with certain gifts, with certain skills, with the gospel. He's entrusted you with these things to bring him glory, Right? We talked about this with Jonah. We talked about this with the gospel workshop. He's entrusted you with the message of the gospel. You're either going to be a good steward of it and go and share it with others, or you're going to be a poor steward and keep it to yourself or not say anything. And by doing that, if you keep it to yourself and not say anything, you're being a poor steward, and guess who's not getting glory? God is it. But, you know, if you're being a good steward and you're taking that message and you're sharing it and say, guess what God has done through Jesus Christ, guess, let, let me tell you about my God. Who's getting the glory? God's getting the glory. That's being a good steward of those things. And so, <coughs> sorry. <coughs> sorry, guys. Um, yeah, we, we need to see that God has entrusted you with very specific things so that you can use them for his glory, 
right? Look back at verse 11 towards the beginning of the verse. It says, whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God, whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies. So we see the oracles, you're saying this is God's message. Hear what he has to say. When you're serving, you're saying this is God's strength. I'm just using it to build other people up. God's getting the glory with those things. So you have to think through whose stuff is it? It's God's. Who gets the glory? God, right? You can't say, oh, this is my stuff. Or you can't say, it's God's stuff, but I'm going to use it to get my glory. It doesn't work that way. God has given you certain things. Use them for his glory. So put this down for point number two. Employ everything that you have for God's glory. Employ everything that you have for God's glory. (coughs) One sec. Um, let's look at these cross-references. Uh, open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 10.31. 1 Corinthians 10.31. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Right? Or listen to this one, Colossians 3.23. Colossians 3.23. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men. So what are you doing? You're acknowledging All of this stuff, it's God's stuff. It's not mine. It's all the Lord's. He's just trusting me to take care of it for a time. And then you need to decide, I'm going to use it to glorify God, and I'm going to do it the right way. So let's go back to the example of me leading worship, okay? So God's given me the skills to play guitar. He's given me this opportunity at Compass to go lead worship on Sunday mornings. Well, I could be a poor steward of this, and I could pick keys that are really hard to sing, but it really shows off how, like, look at my voice, look at how it sounds, and I'm just showing off the whole time, and, like, the songs aren't good theologically, but they just sound really cool, and they have fun riffs, and you know what? People just sit there and, like, wow, like, Johnny really likes this music and stuff, but that's being a poor steward, right? Because people aren't getting the chance to worship. It's hard for them to sing. It's hard for them to follow. They're not dwelling on good lyrics it's just it's become a concert at that point and that's being a very poor steward but on the flip side every week what I try to do I sit down and I look at the songs and I think okay what key is going to be easiest so that everyone can sing or if it's easier for girls to sing on the next song I want guys to be able to sing because I want everyone to be able to join in and praise the Lord and then I think okay well what do these words look like are these words going to help people to love God more Or are they just going to feel good at the end of this? I want them to know God and love God more based off of the words we sing. And then I think, okay, well, how are we going to do this arrangement? Is it going to be easy to sing where people can be like, okay, I'm tracking along. Or it's like, I have no idea how to sing this song. This is way too confusing. And then they don't sing. So I, I think through those things because I want people to be able to worship the Lord. And I'm trying to use my gifts so that people can glorify God. That would be good stewardship versus bad stewardship. So I want you to think, okay, like, as we apply these things, how do you eat to the glory of God? Well, there, there are a few things with that. There, you can show thankfulness that God provided this food for me, right? It can be easy to be mindless and, like, we pray for our food, like, thank you for the food, blessed in my body, amen, and that's it. But really, God has provided this food for you, and, and so you can thank him for that, but then you can also enjoy it, and you can also glorify God by not complaining, you can glorify God by not eating too much or too little, right? Food is fuel so that we can take care of our bodies. You're glorifying God by taking care of your body by what you eat. Well, how do you, f- how do you glorify God? Through sleep, right? How do you do that? You're literally unconscious for eight hours. Well, God has given you your body to serve the church, to share the gospel, all of these different things. If you're constantly exhausted and sleep-deprived, How can you faithfully do those things, right? Being a good steward of your body, you're going to rest and take care of your body so that you're more fit and able to clearly think and share the gospel. And you're going to say, you know what? I need sleep. I need to depend on God. Jesus slept, right? Jesus is fully God. He's also fully human. And he showed us Jesus slept. He was tired. And so there were times that he would sleep. And he was being a good steward of his body. And so for you, you can glorify God in your sleep saying, you know what? I'm going to take care of my body because I want to be a good servant for the Lord. And also, you know what? I'm a weak human being. I need sleep. 
and I need God's help. And that can glorify God. <coughs> We're not going to get into more right now, but maybe in small groups, you know, think how do you have fun to the glory of God? How do you enjoy time with friends? How do you enjoy hobbies or different things? How do you work to the glory of God? How do you do school to the glory of God? So think through these things. Ask yourself these questions because God has entrusted you with this, and someday you'll stand before him and you'll give an account. This is how I stewarded it. Either I was faithful or I wasn't. I took care of it or I didn't. I was a bad steward of your stuff or I was a good steward, right? So realize you don't have a choice. Everything that's been given to you, God's entrusted to you. Congratulations. You're all stewards. You can't back out of it now. There is no contract. God has entrusted you these things. And someday you're going to say either here's how I stewarded it for your glory or yeah, I, I didn't really do that. And there's going to be problems. So <clears throat> ask yourself these questions. What has God entrusted to me and how am I currently stewarding it? And if I'm stewarding it poorly, how can I steward it to the glory of God? And remember, stewardship, you're managing it. You're properly taking care of it. You're using it. Um, it's going to require you to slow down and think very intentionally, very hard about this. And it's going to take hard work. And it's going to take discipline. But it's also going to take faithfulness. Right, and so let's go back to First Peter four. Um, a few verses earlier, I believe it was verse seven. He says, "As each has received a gift, use it to serve." And then at the, <coughs> oh no no, that was in verse ten. Sorry. And then he says, "Use it to serve in order that God may be glorified." Earlier, he says, "The end of all things is at hand." Therefore, and then he goes into this. Uh, and so with this, we don't know when our stewardship is going to end. Right? You don't know when you may die. You don't know when Christ may come back. All you know is that you're a steward. And you're going to be a steward till the day you die. So <clears throat> you aren't told how long you're going to be a steward. You're also not told, like, the results as far as, like, how much you're supposed to attain. Right? God's not like, okay, as a steward, I need you to each evangelize to 30 people. You need to lead five people to Christ. You need to sing a hundred worship songs. You need to read the entire Bible five times, and then you're a good steward. No, he doesn't give us that. He, he simply says, you've received a gift. Use it to serve in order that God may be glorified. And then we see at the end of that verse, in verse 11, he says, to him belong glory and dominion forever and ever and ever. Right? So we see that we're given these gifts. We're told to use them to serve for God's glory, and we know that God's glory lasts forever. He deserves glory forever and ever. And so, put it down this way for point number three, prioritize faithfulness more than results. Prioritize faithfulness more than results. And why do I say this? Well, I say this because we need to commit to faithfully stewarding what has been entrusted to us, not until we achieve some earthly benchmark no, we steward as long as we have the stewardship, and we do it for God's glory, because His glory endures forever, right? So, if you're being faithful, if, if God has entrusted you, like, let's say with food, you eat food every day. If you're eating your food to the glory of God every day, and you're being faithful, that's what God asks of you. He doesn't say, eat 450 meals to the glory of God. He just says, say, use your gift to serve me for my glory, and His glory endures forever, so we need to prioritize faithfulness more than results. And why do we do this? <clears throat> well, we see that what happens if you don't get the results that you thought you were going to get? Let's say, okay, you share the gospel with 30 people and no one makes a profession of faith. Well, if, if, we're, supposed to be faith, if we're supposed to use our gift to get certain results, you may get discouraged and be like, you know what, I'm going to give up. No one's making a profession of faith and this isn't working. I'm... I'm done. And you may get discouraged, but that's not what God calls us to. He calls us to use our gifts to the glory of God. And you can do that regardless of if someone makes a profession of faith or not. Jeremiah was a prophet, right? And he, throughout his whole ministry, he never saw people repent to his message, but he was still faithful every single day. He was faithful to God's glory. And so for you guys, it doesn't matter the results. God calls you to be faithful. Your parents may do something. They may not see your faithfulness, right? Or you may be faithful and you're eating to the glory of God and someone may never know. So what if no one else ever knows? God knows and God's getting the glory in that and that's what matters. 
well, what happens if maybe you get way more results than you thought you'd get? Maybe you're, so let's go back to the guitar one. Let's say I'm using it for myself. In, or maybe, you know, maybe I'm wanting to use it for God's glory and I see tons of people just loving worship. All of a sudden there are record deals and all this stuff. We're t- writing tons of worship music. It's like super successful. I'm like, yeah, this is great. And I start to get proud and all of a sudden the glory is starting to go back to, my, to myself, right? And that's, that's not what God calls us to. He calls us to be faithful. He says, hey, hey, you've been given gifts. Use them to serve for my glory. And you just keep serving and using it to his glory until you die, or until he comes back. That is what faithful stewardship is. This is what God asks of us, and that's what we need to do. And so, in the next two weeks, what we're going to be doing is we're going to get into some of the specific specific things that most of you guys probably have been entrusted in. We're going to look at how do you faithfully steward those specific things, whether it's time, or maybe it's your resources, or your relationship with the Lord. But in all of this, I want us to think, how can we faithfully manage the things that God has entrusted to us. Because at the end of the day, that's what matters. Faithfully managing what God has entrusted to us. Why? For his glory. So in small groups, let's get into this. Let's look at what has God entrusted to us and how can we use it for his glory. Let's pray. (coughs) Dear Lord, we thank you that you're a gracious God. We know that you have given us all things and we know that so often we are poor stewards of what you've given to us. We don't take care of your property, and we often use it for ourselves rather than for you and for that. We ask your forgiveness, but Lord, we also thank you that you've given us opportunities to grow to be better stewards of these things. And Lord, we want to be faithful. We want to use them for your glory. So help us to do that better uh, so that all the praise will go to you. In Jesus' name.